um, for an individual who, at the initial point, uh, have, may, have, may have an understanding of, of uh, things as being permanent. Um, at the initial stage, that sort of grasping at permanence of things could be quite strong and intense. Now, in order to lessen that grip, loosen that grip, uh, you need uh, some form of critical reasoning, uh, which could, even if it can, it can cast a doubt or suspicion in the person's mind uh, as to things being permanent, that has in itself uh, you know, made an impact on the person's mind because it has at least had the effect of loosening the grip of things being permanent or eternal. Now, that is again not enough. You need further uh, reinforcement of critical reasoning to uh, point you towards a kind of a, uh, tending more towards the impermanence of things. Even that is not enough. You need a further conviction, and that can be gained through, again, constant reflection. And that can lead to what is known as the inferential understanding or intellectual understanding of impermanence. And that, again, is not enough in order to have a strong impact on your, on, on your behavior. Uh, you have to gain direct insight or intuitive experience of the impermanence of things. And, um, and that, again, needs to be further perfected because the idea is that the, the grasping at permanence is deeply embedded in your consciousness, that it's not just a one insight can, can, uh, can dispel it. It's a, it's a long process of, of uh, deepening your insight that would eventually uh, dispel that, that even a smallest tendency towards grasping at permanence. Uh, so this is the, there's a, it's a long process of kind of, you know, deepening your insight. So this would be the same in the case of emptiness or any other things. Um, however, there are, on the other side, there are s certain aspects of the path which may have less to do with cognitive experiences, which may have more to do with I suppose one could say enhancement of the heart, like compassion, bodhicitta, and so on. In these uh, areas, at the initial stage, of course, one has to develop some understanding of what compassion is, and then you have to have some sort of notion of how that could be enhanced. And then as a result of your uh, practice, you may gain at the initial stage some kind of simulated experience of these you know, when you sit down and think, you may feel you're compassionate. But that compassionate may not be long-lasting. That may not be pervasive. That may not permeate your, your very being. So what, what is needed is a further deepening of that experience so that the, your compassion becomes spontaneous. It is not dependent upon a, a sort of intellectual stim, simulation. Rather, it would be a truly spontaneous, re, re, responsive to uh, you know, sort of occasions that would demand that uh, response. And through that, again, that, that experience of compassion could be further deepened and it becomes universal. So there is, again, a different aspect of the path. So it's, it's again, here, there's a long process. Any, uh, <clears throat> yeah. uh, Mutun de Yarge Ralia, any Penander, Penamidabo Mufun Tonding Logic, Penadami Mufun Tonding Logic, Mutun Yarge Rala, Turkey, and Rajaguea. Turkey told you to the idea, Tambo Chaya Dian, dear, but never be Tamil Payalian, Shiro Traje, and Tamshin with the Bet Sumjin to Stobu. So these two aspects of the path uh, are known as in the technical Buddhist language uh, the method aspect of the path and the insight or the wisdom aspect of the path. And these two must go hand in hand. These, must be, these two must be combined. Because in order for the insights to be uh, enhanced and deepened, you need the complementing factors from the method aspects, such as compassion and bodhicitta and so on. Similarly, in order to enhance and deepen your realization of compassion and bodhicitta, you need, uh, and also in order to strengthen them, you need the factor of wisdom, the insight. Uh, which would sort of, you know, ground them, which would sort of enhance them. So you need, therefore, uh, a sort of an approach where there is a combination or the union of method and wisdom. Diana, daily chairman, 
kasure penam penam mida ko to ko lot ki ko gender ti tangzing lo tro da penam mida ko thong penam mida ko musul thong ju jane ta di ka da tangzing lo ti ma ba cha ba di ine a da tangzing lo ti ju che ki ya ko kasure mida ko to ko lot ti pe kasure pe ji ko ba tamir pe ali ya ta dong tangzing lo ti jane ki ki ju da so similarly, in the case of, say, insight into impermanence, although that very insight would uh, enable the individual to overcome grasping that permanence, but um, that does not mean to say that that part alone would lead to total liberation, because there are many other fetters of mind that uh, constructs the mind, such as grasping at... Uh, liberation, um, No. 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 Uh, sorry, um, that insight into impermanence and deepening that alone is not enough even to perfect that insight. You need further uh, complementary factors because there are other, uh, other factors within your mind. It's not just permanence, grasping at permanence, but also grasping at independent reali- you know, ob- you know, objective reality of things, grasping at uh, abiding principles or grasping at uh, intrinsic reality. So these need to be counteracted through, again, developing insight into emptiness. So, so what you see here is a very complex process of uh, progression of an individual's level of consciousness through spiritual processes towards perfection. Um, <clears throat> Your Holiness, is there a difference between thought and action uh, relating to cause and effect uh, that is to say, can a thought cause an action and vice versa? Peji, Mazan the last is in a Sembelega Santamro, Sembele Santamina, Samuran, Gunuran, Gunus or better. Of course, when we talk about uh, the Buddhist concept of karma or karmic action, it is not confined to the bodily action alone. It also embraces uh, the mental acts <coughs> or emotional acts, if one could say. Um, <coughs> for example, uh, when we talk about uh, acts of covetousness or uh, harmful intention, and these need not necessarily uh, manifest in behavior, uh, one can have a, the full action of these thoughts without being expressed in, <coughs> in action at all. So one can see a completion of these acts even at the sort of at the level of mind or thought. <clears throat> uh, Your Holiness, it is a well-known fact that you are a very busy person with many demands on your time. Could you advise a lay person with home, family, and work, work demands how to develop a systematic shadu uh, or pattern of uh, practice? <laughs> Systematic to pattern of the routine of the machine. The machine is a good thing. 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 The machine we must know that uh, it is uh, uh, something that needs to be done 24 hours of the day. So that's why in the traditional Buddhist explanation, we make a distinction between uh, actual meditation sessions and post-meditational periods. The idea being that both while you are in the meditative session and also when you are out of it, you should, you're, you should be fully uh, within the, uh, the realm of practice. When you are in the meditative session, you have to be able to do it. You have to be able to do it. You have to uh, 
ราบายอนาคต So <coughs> in fact the post meditational periods are a real test for strength of your practice um, uh, because one could say that um, uh, the, during the meditation in some sense you are equipping yourself so that when you come out of your meditation session you will be you are better equipped to deal with the demands of the everyday Uh, reality of your existence. Uh, this is analogous to uh, recharging your battery. The very, the very purpose of recharging your battery is that so that you could use it to do to run something. To <clears throat> um, so similarly, um, you know, once you have equipped yourself in your meditation through you know, sort of whatever practices that you engage in, um, as a human being, uh, you can't avoid. Uh, the daily routines of your existence, uh, be it uh, interacting with others or, or <clears throat> all the everyday realities of your existence, these are something that, as human beings, you cannot avoid. And it is during these periods that uh, you should be able to live according to the principles of your dharma practice, and that is the real test. So, today, you can t e l e that you can tell that you can tell that you can tell that you Some does matter, and how shall he? Then take some stand it does, you come near any sort of Nisha Tuchi, Korachi, Shiru, or those men. Tapper, the young Kormi, Church Timber, and Dotiachi, the young Guru. Thank you, Bazus, get much better Church Timber, and the Jesuit as an Kaushar, and Bazus, much better young Tayama. So, of course, uh, at the initial stage, uh, as a beginner, you do need uh, sort of periods of concentrated um, uh, meditation on practice so that you have a kind of a, at least a base. From which you can begin. <clears throat> so this is very crucial. And then once you have established that kind of base, base, then of course you will be able to then adopt a way of life where your daily activities, everyday activities of your so your or of your life, could be at least be made to uh, accord with the principles of the Dharma. So what it does point out, point to, is the uh, the importance of uh, making an effort. So. Uh, without effort, um, there is no way that we can uh, uh, integrate uh, the, the principles of dharma in one's life. 